Hello there, internet strangers. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Welcome to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be just going over my hike on the Isle of Skye Trail, which I did at the beginning of June 2022. Um, if you haven't already, I do encourage you to go over and watch my actual video of the hike. Um, it's a bit of a kind of silent, peaceful hiking video so I don't really explain much I just walk through sky and you can see some of the scenery and get an idea of what to expect if you want to do the trail yourself um, but I just thought I would do this video as well just to go over the sort of finer details about how I actually did the trail where I stayed uh, things like that so as you can see here on the right side uh, in yellow, this is the actual trail that I did that I recorded from my phone. Um, it's about 137 kilometers or around 85 miles, I believe. Um, and I did the trail in six days, um, which was four nights of wild camping um, and then one night halfway through in Portree in a hostel. Just to say, you know, I got extremely lucky on this hike. In Scotland, the weather, well, especially in Skye, the weather can be extremely bad sometimes. And somehow I got really, really lucky and I more or less had six days of sunshine. So if you've watched my video already of the actual uh, hike, don't expect that. You might get lucky as I did, but don't expect it. Anyway, so let's crack on to how I did this. So I got a flight up to Inverness and then I got a bus all the way over to Portree. So I arrived in Portree in the evening. So that night I just crashed in a hostel there. The following day, I got an early bus up um, to the beginning of the trail, a place called Duntulum. Um, but you actually need to get off a little bit before Duntulum at just roughly around where this car park is. Um, although if you just say to the bus driver, the red phone box, they'll usually know what you mean. So this is where the start of the trail is. Um, as you can see, on this day I travelled from the beginning of the trail at the car park all the way round to the Kerrang. So let's zoom in a little bit. So the beginning of the trail is really not hard to find. The bus will drop you off somewhere around here which is where the phone box is and you just need to go up a little bit on this road to where the car park is and then you'll see a sign and you just want to essentially head up north and at this point the path is pretty obvious pretty clear and then essentially you're just um, hiking across this sort of marshland but on a pretty good track so nothing to worry about here and eventually you get to the the northern point of sky well pretty much the northern point uh, it's called the Rubehunish. Um, and you'll kind of work your way around the trailhead and you'll eventually come to this bothy here. Um, a lot of people do sleep there. There's a couple of spaces, a couple of beds anyway, hard wooden beds if you want. So and if the weather's bad, it's a really good place to sleep. There's a bit of information about how the bothy was uh, made when it was set up and everything like that. So I had a little stop there. I admired the views looking out over Ruba Hunish. This is the most northern point of sky. Yeah, it's a really fantastic place. Okay, so after you've visited the Bothy, um, you just want to carry on round the headland down around the coast. And I would say this is probably where the path becomes a little less obvious, uh, but it's still not difficult to follow and obviously at this point you're just following the coast along the cliffs and honestly it's a really really beautiful walk this this was actually probably one of my favorite days the views that you get along here are absolutely stunning especially if you had a have a nice day like I did anyway once you come to this point um, you do just have to be on your guard 
just to make sure that you don't carry on round um, the coast. So I would definitely recommend, well, for the whole trail anyway, having a trail map or at least something on your phone. So I downloaded some GPX maps from the Highlands website, which I will put in the description. Uh, and they were really, really super useful. And I used a map, uh, a map app called OS Maps, I think. So then you carry on down. This is kind of like farmland, um, but still a really, really beautiful walk. And at this point, you're getting really good views of the Kerrang, to be honest. See, if you've watched my video, you'll see that I have a sit down here, I think. You then get to around St. Morlogs Church. You rejoin the road for a little bit and you go around this small sort of little hamlet. Um, and there is a river here where you can fill up with water, which is super useful. And then you're more or less just carrying on round the coast. There are moments where you're getting really, really close to the edge. Um, so do be careful, especially if it's a windy day. Um, but it's a really, really beautiful walk. Uh, you just got stunning views out over the sea. You carry around, there's some old ruins here and there's another river here where you can fill up. Um, but yet yeah, more or less just Carrying on round the coast, at this point you get to a beach around here and this is where you want to kind of cut up towards Flodigary Backpackers Hostel. Uh, and this is where a lot of people end day one. If they're not camping, they tend to stay in this Backpackers Hostel. I actually stopped there for a bit, I filled up my water, um, I charged up a few things. I just took a bit of a break there, as you can see. But I didn't want to stop there because I wanted to obviously camp that night. So after that I carried on and there's a little bit of road walking here to be honest. Um, which I obviously don't like doing so much. But it means you can kind of pick up the pace a little bit. So I sort of blitz this bit super quickly. And then you get to this point which is where the hike for the Kerrang starts or ends depending on which way round you do it so here there's quite an obvious path again so it's not difficult to see and here you're sort of beginning a bit of an ascent actually so this bit is a little bit tiring but it's nothing too strenuous there are a few spots around Loch Langake to camp I saw someone camping around here but I wanted to carry on so that is what I did. I carried on up this hill, um, a bit slow going. There's also this Loch Hasco, but to be honest, there wasn't that many places, or at least from what I could see to camp because the ground wasn't that flat. I did fill up with water. It's a good spot actually to fill up with water if you're gonna be camping because it's probably the last point uh, on this day that you come across a big source of water. You can see that I'm sort of looking for places to camp around here but not really finding any luck so just carried on around the Kerrang and then I found a really really great spot uh, it must have been used several times before uh, but as you can see it's a really like flat piece of grass with just stunning views over the sky and it came just about the right time there was no one else camping there so a beautiful beautiful spot and that's where I pitched up for the night so as you can see I covered around 21.6 kilometers on that day and it took me about nine hours and 15 minutes and that was day one so day two, I woke up nice and early to another glorious day in my beautiful campsite looking out over the sky. Uh, and I got a nice early start, uh, mainly because I knew that today was going to be a big old day. Um, so I rejoined the trail here, as you can see, and you just kind of follow the hill round. I filled up some water here because there was a stream coming down 
and you just come all the way around till you get to the Kerrang lookout. And obviously, as it suggests, you've got really incredible views of the not only the Kerrang but also the Trottenish Ridge from here. And this is as this car park here, which is where a lot of sort of day hikers come just to hike the Kerrang or the Trottenish Ridge. So from there on is where your sort of day on the Trottenish begins. And this was really a beast of a day. So do not underestimate it. I mean, I knew it was going to be tough uh, and it was tough and I had good weather. So I can't imagine what it's like in the wind and rain. Uh, but essentially it's just, you know, it's up and down all day. And when you're carrying a backpack as I was, which was probably like 12 or 13 kilos. Yeah, it's tiring. But again, it's not a difficult path to follow because you're just following the, the ridge, essentially. Uh, there are moments like this where you do come in a bit. Um, so you do need to just keep an eye on your uh, your map but there is a bit more of an obvious path because a lot of people do this part of the trail but there's really not that much to explain on this day to be honest because you're essentially just following the ridge just a lot of up and down you know it's again it's a really beautiful really beautiful walk at points like this when you're looking back and you got the view over the ridge and the Kerrang it's it's really amazing so just carried along along the ridge just a lot of ups and downs obviously one thing to be wary of on this day is that there's really not that much water when you're coming down there are sort of as maybe you can see here there are sort of pools of water occasionally um, but they do tend to be pretty brown and murky so I recommend carrying as much water as you can on this day which again obviously adds to the weight that you're carrying so not easy um, I believe some people do drink from these streams uh, from these pools obviously with a filter I definitely wouldn't recommend it otherwise but I just carried all the water that I needed on that day so again that made it really tough but you know, I really enjoyed it. It was beautiful and not too many people, to be honest. So it's just, you know, a lot of hiking along the ridge. And I think it was around this point that it was starting to get late. Well, it was probably around six or something and I was getting really tired. So I wanted to find a place to sleep for the night. Uh, but I did struggle a bit to be honest and this was probably the only place on the trail where I struggled to find a suitable campsite. Now I did see some other people camping up here on the top of the ridge but it was even on quite a nice day it was still a bit windy so I kind of wanted to get down a bit into the valley so I tried to come down here a bit as you can see I did struggle initially to find something flat um, or just not rocky and I kind of walked around a bit until eventually I ended up around here now I'm not too sure what exactly this area is called but it's yeah it's about that far from this store anyway that's where I pitched up for the night so as you can see again, I did 21.9 kilometers on this day. On to day three. Um, now this day I thought was gonna be relatively straightforward. Just a nice simple hike back to Portree. It actually turned out to be a lot harder than I expected and I kind of wish that I'd made a little bit more progress on the second day but these are the sort of things that you just really don't know on these hikes the morning itself was not too bad i woke up fortunately on another great day it was a little well it was pretty cold actually in the morning um and actually i did have a little spot of rain overnight in fact the first 
and only time that I had rain, I think, on the hike. So I did need to cover up a little bit, but it didn't take long before it got pretty warm again. At this point, I did come off the trail a little bit. So it's not too obvious where the trail is meant to be, to be honest. So when you come down here, I saw some other people going all the way around and I didn't really want to do that. So I sort of tried to cut a corner, but I wasn't really on any sort of major path. It was just kind of climbing up a bank. So it was a bit tough, but you know, as long as you got um, a good map, you'll, you'll be able to find your way. Once I got to the top, I kind of rejoined the main path anyway and then you kind of come around it starts to get a bit more of a clear path as you know this bit is getting close to the store where a lot of people are hiking so i'd say down here is where you, you start getting a, a proper path again and then you come around and obviously this is where the old man of store is which um is very busy especially on a day like that it was really really busy a lot of people come in here just for like a, a short hike from the car park. So I just kind of sat there and enjoyed looking out over the old man of store for a bit before cracking on. And you kind of, you just head down the hill basically. This is obviously a major footpath. Lots of people hiking on it down to the car park. Uh, then you've got to go along the road a little bit and then you join this little side road which goes past Loch Lethen. Lethen. So you kind of go around the lock, over the dam, down this road. Now I did make a little bit of a mistake here. I thought that maybe the path went down that way, but I was, because there wasn't, there really wasn't an obvious path here. So I ended up going up there but it was quite good actually just to see that view it's a really beautiful lookout and then i came back down and i'm not surprised that i missed this path at all because this is where there is really nothing obvious at all and for the most of the rest of this day it's really not clear where the path is supposed to be even even then in june it was a bit muddy uh, and a bit swampy in places so I can imagine in any other time of the year, this would be really tough. But again, although the actual path itself is not that clear, it's not that you're going to get lost because you're following the coast, really. So as I mentioned, this section of this day was a lot harder than I actually had anticipated. And the reason for that is that it's actually a lot more up and down. I thought it was going to be a bit similar to the first day where you're just hugging the coast, but it is actually more of what the second day was, similar to the Trottenish Ridge, a lot of up and down. Not as much, but a bit of it. On top of that, a lot of it, well, particularly this first section, is very swampy, so it's very slow progress. And the other thing was that there really wasn't any water. And I hadn't really planned very well for that. So I ended up hiking for quite a long time, possibly three or four hours on not a lot of water. And I was getting very thirsty. So it was a really long day, to be honest. There was a little section where I kind of came off the main path a little bit accidentally, but I kind of quickly rejoined it up here anyway. So again, you kind of are just following this ridge all the way around until you're getting to Loch Portree. And this is got kind of the final stretch back to Portree, which seemed relatively straightforward, but again, it took me a long time to kind of work my way down through these fields, down the hill, and then you're kind of going around this headland, which it all took me a lot longer. Maybe it's just that I was getting tired and anxious to get back to Portree and have a proper night's sleep. So anyway, I got back to Portree through the town um, and that night I stayed in Portree Youth Hostel, which is just here. And that was day three. So day four, obviously I woke up in Portree 
and I hiked all the way over to Sligacan, Sligacan Valley. Um, and a lot of people actually do skip out day four, but I knew that I wanted to do the whole trail and I'm really glad that I didn't skip it out. It was still a really beautiful section, you know. Maybe not as beautiful as some of the other parts of the trail, but anywhere else, you know, this would be a perfectly good hike. So I'm really glad that I didn't skip it out. And I recommend if you can to try and do the whole trail, including this part. I don't know, for me, it just brought me a lot of satisfaction knowing that I've gone from A to B, you know, just with my own two feet. So anyway, I had a sort of a bit more of a leisurely morning. Um, I went to the shops in Portree. I restocked. I got some more gas. Um, there is a useful shop in Portree called Inside Out, which has obviously lots of sort of outdoor equipment. Uh, there is also probably the only other place really to buy food for the trail is the co-op, which is around here. Um, it's not the biggest co-op in the world, but obviously, you know, it's a good place to stock up on supplies. So the trail kind of takes you along the main road. So there's quite a bit of road walking to start off with. And then at some point, just past the Isle of Skye Candle Co Visitor Centre, uh, you want a bare left and it's really not obvious to be honest there's like a really small path that just cuts off from the road but it's quite easy to miss so just be on the lookout for that be be wary that that's where you need to cut off i'm not sure if there are too many other opportunities because it's a bit foresty around here but anyway that takes you back down to lock portree and then you're essentially just following that for a little bit until you get to the Varagil River. And this is a really beautiful section of the trail, to be honest. I really enjoyed this. I'd had a good night's sleep in Portree, so I was feeling a bit revitalised. And then you get to this bridge where you kind of rejoin the road. And from then on, it is quite a lot of road walking. But I, I actually quite enjoyed it because I could really pick up the pace and I don't know, I was just feeling full of energy. So I barely stopped to be honest. I did all of this in just a few hours, maybe because I just wanted to get back to the, to the main path. Anyway, you keep going along the road until you get just past Bray's Beach. Um, and it's about here where, yeah, just here where the road ends. Um, so it was around there that I just stopped for lunch um, and just admired the view really over Loch Sligacham. So I made quite a lot of progress in quite a short amount of time. And then the rest of the day is really just, there's quite a main path here actually. So you really, again, you can't really get lost, um, but you're just following following the lock and there's a few kind of streams coming down so a few places to fill up your water bottle and then not before long you kind of get to this estuary bit where it kind of flattens out and then you get to Slegakin camping a lot of people were camping here um, so that would have been a good spot for me to stop but I was feeling in quite good spirits. I, I think it was still around four in the afternoon or something, so I felt like I had more time in me. Um, but I stopped at the old bridge here for a little bit. Um, quite a lot of people around here, obviously, really beautiful place. And then I carried on, and you want to kind of go over the bridge and just go past this Holly and Mackenzie statue and follow the path from there on. There are a few paths going sort of different directions so you do need to be a bit careful about which one you're taking but anyway at this point there were a lot of people coming back from their sort of various day hikes. So around this point I was really kind of looking out for places to camp for the night 
until I got uh, here. And this was a really great patch of land, really close to the path to be honest, so a little bit exposed, but I couldn't resist this spot because it was just completely flat and it's just, you know, great views in the valley. And there were a few streams that I could fill up my water in, so I couldn't really have asked for more except for the fact that this was really the first night where the midges started to arrive and i mean arrive in in style so gradually uh gradually in the evening you know as i was making my dinner and setting up and stuff they just started to appear and fortunately for me i managed to have my dinner and get dressed and everything and set up just in time because I mean, it was pretty, pretty horrendous. But as I said, managed to get into my tent um, and settle down. And that was the end of day four. And I did a total of 26 kilometers on that day in around eight hours. So, you know, shorter, a lot shorter, but further distance. So you can really see the difference on this day. And that was that. So on to day five. And this was actually probably one of my favorite days. Uh, the scenery was absolutely stunning, especially on this kind of section down through the Sligacan Valley and around Kamasunari Bay. I felt like I was on some kind of desert island or something. It was really, really that good. It was also my longest day so i ended up clocking up 30 kilometers in the end and hiking for almost 12 hours and that was partly due to the fact that i wanted to camp around here but the wind coming up through this valley was so strong so i had to kind of push on through torin uh, because obviously Torin is a town and there weren't many places to camp there and I ended up down here which was lovely uh, but it was quite a bit further than I anticipated but anyway I'll come on to that in a bit um, obviously as I mentioned the midges that night were horrendous and it was no better in the morning uh, in fact it was probably worse in the morning and it made it really difficult to make breakfast and uh, get changed and everything without just getting absolutely swarmed by midges so just be very wary of that uh, especially in this area around river sligacan lots of midges maybe if you can try and get a little bit higher up maybe there'd be a bit of a breeze anyway on this day it's really not difficult at all you're just following the valley not sure exactly where it was but oh yeah, it was here. It was a, like a running stream and I had a really good little dip in some really cold but really refreshing water, which is what I needed after a midge infested night. Um, and then you carry on down, you go past this lock around here until you get to Loch I don't know how you say that. Uh, but as I mentioned, this, this area is absolutely stunning. I filled up with some water there and then went onwards to Kamasunari Bay. Now, I know that there is um, a kind of side trail that you can do, which is, I believe it goes around here where you can do the bad step. I was tempted to do that, but I have heard that it is pretty sketchy and I was on my own. So maybe in hindsight, Oh, I should have uh, because it sounds like a lot of fun but I was quite happy to just carry on down this valley and this spot around Kamasunari Bay is absolutely stunning there's a beautiful beach um, so I just sat down and had some food and enjoyed the scenery around here and then you know the official official trail goes around Elgol here but I'd sort of, and maybe this is cheating a little bit, 
but I'd made up my mind that I wanted to try and get the trail done in six days at that point and not try and risk having to do it in seven partly because of the weather and partly because I just wanted to make sure I had enough time to rest afterwards so I decided to cut off this corner and from what I've heard it's it is a, a good section but I don't know if there's anything particularly special maybe I'm wrong maybe you, you can correct me in the comments here but anyway so I kind of hiked up this hill and then down towards Kilmarie now this section wasn't the most exciting section and there's a little bit of road walking along here and then you kind of cut up through this a bit sort of marsh not marshy but it sort of a bit of boggy section here and then you go down through the forest here so it's not as beautiful but it's still still a good hike and I was getting really really tired on this day to be honest um, and as I mentioned I, I wanted to ideally camp around here but the wind was so bad so I kind of had to just press on cut a little corner across there and then you're just doing quite a bit of road walking as you can see here I was looking for spaces to camp but so I kind of added on to my my kilometers hiked but you know I wanted to find somewhere and there were probably places it was just the wind was just a bit crazy so I pressed on through Torin again I had like a bit of a wander around this hill here but it was partly just windy partly just not very flat so anyway I pushed on down around this road and then I decided I think at this point to head for this place Kamas Malag which I'd heard was a good place to camp anyway so I basically just persevered until I got to Kamas Malag and by this point I was absolutely dead and it didn't help that Kamas Malag was a really stony beach even the grassy section is there's just a lot of stones underneath so pitching the tent wasn't easy also it was still a bit windy here but by this point you know I just had to stop aside from that it was an absolutely beautiful place to camp definitely recommend it you know if you find yourself around that area so that was day five and as I mentioned before I did a total of 30.6 kilometers so my longest day so far so finally on to my final day, day six, uh, where I went from Camus Malag near Torin to the end of the trail in Broadford. So I woke up in really good spirits in Camus Malag knowing that this, I was pretty certain this was going to be my last day. And again, another beautiful day. So I set off from Camus Malag fairly early with the intention of getting back to Broadford in good time to have a shower and just relax really. So I made pretty speedy progress around here and you're kind of following a pretty main, a main road at this point which becomes a path but it's still a very obvious path and again you're just kind of following your way around the coast so really not difficult to find your way at all uh, is around somewhere around this point where you kind of drop from the top of the, the, the cliffs down you make your way down to the seafront and then you kind of walk just along the beach here and I decided to actually have a little swim in the sea there which was pretty cold but really really refreshing and then you just carry on along the, the seafront this is where there are some old stone settlements. Oh yeah, it's called Bordedag, I think. That's how you pronounce it. Um, which is really cool to see as well. You then just start to make your way back up the hill. Um, and this section is a little bit tedious, to be honest. Maybe it's just that I was quite keen to get back. But I wouldn't say it's the most exciting section. Um, there are some pretty good views from, I'd say, around here. 
but other than that it kind of it's it's very flat and not as interesting as some of the other sections so i'm kind of glad that i'd made it a little bit of a shorter day and i was pretty keen to get back and then there's not really that much to say about this day because you're just essentially just following this path all the way back to broadford um and it's at this point you kind of go through a gate and that's the last the last point in which you leave the path and then you're essentially you're just back on the main road and back into broadford and that night i just checked myself into broadford backpackers hostel and i arrived around 2 p.m i think or something like that yeah and i covered 18 kilometers still uh, in six and a half hours so i still covered a fair distance but i was able to get back sort of mid-afternoon and have an afternoon slash evening off which was great so there you go that was my hike on the isle of sky trail um i as i mentioned i did the hike in six days and i covered around 137 kilometers in total it was an absolutely glorious hike and i cannot recommend it highly enough um so i hope you found that video useful in some way if you did please let me know um obviously i'm hoping to do some more hikes like this and if if you do find this useful um i'd love to put together more videos like this um if you haven't already i'll put a link to my um my actual hiking video up here somewhere so please do go over and have a look at that uh, but otherwise hopefully i'll see you soon on the next video until then happy hiking see you next time Thank you.